Will you stand with me again tonight as we honor the ministry? Amen. Tell Sister Beth Stevens welcome tonight as she comes. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give that back to the Lord. Would you do that? Amen. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You can be seated today. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for your welcome. And I'm just so excited again to, to be in Oklahoma, in uh, Locust Grove, uh, Oklahoma at that. And uh, I uh, we have a Locust Grove right there close to where I was born and raised in in uh, Georgia, close to Griffin, Georgia. And so uh, when they told me uh, the first time I ever came here and they told me I was going to uh, come into Locust Grove, I thought, well, I'm just going to feel right at home. And I do. And uh, I do. I just feel like I'm among friends. And, and uh, I just i am thankful for that today. Amen. Just glad you're here tonight and encourage you again. Uh, tomorrow night, just come on back. Let's believe God. Bring somebody with you, somebody that needs a miracle. And I just believe we can have a, a, a great revival. Amen. It started this morning, and we're believing it just to continue on. Amen. Thank the Lord for that today. Hallelujah. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is where I'd like to look at today. Read from today. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. Wow. Thank the Lord. Aren't you glad today we can look in the mirror and we can say that a walk and talk and miracle. Uh, that the Lord has done in our lives. I'm so grateful today. Amen. We don't deserve to be here. It's just through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord today. Amen. I've got a message today to preach. It's a little bit different maybe for a revival. I don't know. Uh, but it's just kind of what was on my heart. And so I just want to share with you uh, some thoughts with uh, with you uh, concerning this these uh, scriptures in Psalm 78. I want to read it. And then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Let's look at it. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He have done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. So even children that have not even yet been born, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Amen. Let's stop there and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I'm just going to ask you to pray out loud with me today. Would you help me pray? Father, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be back in your house on a Sunday night. Thank you for your, your, your children, your, your people that have come and gathered here today, obviously hungry, obviously desperate for you to move in their lives. And so, Father, we know that you will not deny us. Matter of fact, your word tells us that those that are hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And so, Lord, we're believing today that we're going to leave out of this place filled and changed today. And we give you all the praise and the glory, all the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shout out amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I, um, I, I talked to Sister Edna. Matter of fact, I probably talked their ears off yesterday coming uh, from the airport to hear um, uh, about this subject, about this, this thought that's in my heart, been in my heart for quite some time. Uh, so today, um, there's probably nothing worse than a preacher getting on a soapbox. And so I don't want to do that. Uh, I just want to give you the word of God today, but I want to give you the thoughts that the Lord has really put in my heart and, and just been stirring my heart about this. And I just pray that this will minister to you and give you a challenge as well as myself. Just challenge our hearts uh, to go deeper with the Lord. And as I begin to think about um, this scripture here, I was reminded of something that that we did, mostly the guys did, but I was always kind of a little tomboy and I, I loved to play ball with them and and my mom would have to just about make me come in, you know, from uh, play it, trying to play football with the guys in the neighborhood. I don't know why I was just like that, always kind of athletic. And, and uh, I could be uh, mean as the rest of them. But uh, so anyway, I guess that's why I felt I, I fit in like I did. But we had a lot of neighborhood kids and uh, just one of those things. That's kind of how I grew up. 
in the suburbs, I guess, of Griffin. And uh, But something that I'd seen happen, I've seen it on TV, I've seen it in different places, and you probably have as well, uh, something that uh, they would play uh, street basketball. And, and what would happen, and some of you probably know, maybe you've played like this before, uh, street basketball, but what would happen is you'd have all these teams, and you'd have two teams on the court, of course, and they would play, and whichever team lost had to come off of the court, and then the uh, another team that was sitting on the sidelines, they, they called it. They said, hey, I've got next. In other words, I've got the next game. I, uh, we're going to play, and the winning team would stay on the court, but the losing team always would have to come off, and, and so um, uh, that was the cry, though, that came out from the, the teams that were on the sideline, and one, one of them would claim it. They'd say, hey, I've got next, and so we always knew that would be the next team that would come on, that would try to overthrow the winning team and and so I began to think about this generation and 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 just a real concern in my heart and a, a thought in my heart because I believe that, that the time that we're living in that this generation is facing an onslaught from hell like no other generation that we know has ever faced. Uh, I'm sure maybe in, in uh, ancient times, and, and we read about what happened with the Romans and all that, and I know there were some hard days, but as far as what we know, uh, these days that we're living in is some of the most uh, uh, concerning times and most dreadful times for, for our young people. Matter of fact, I've not, um, I'm not that old, and, and I uh, can think back, though, and look back at high school, and today I would never imagine facing some of the things that kids today are facing. I mean, really, it almost just uh, is beyond what my mind can even imagine, the, the pressures, the, uh, the, the way that the enemy is attacking this generation. And, and even I talked to a young girl the other day, a young lady the other day. She's a, a youth pastor's wife anyway, and, and she's about 25, and she said, uh, really, kids in school now, kids in our youth group now, are dealing with things that even I didn't deal with. So things are changing so rapidly. We're dealing with things uh, turning so rapidly. And so really, my, my heart just goes out to this generation. And, and really, the call comes into my heart today, and that is, who's got next? Who's got this next generation? Who is raising up this next generation? Who is teaching this next generation? And as I think about uh, those basketball teams as they cry out, I've got next. I believe God is wanting to raise up a generation of people. He's wanting to raise you and I up that will scream out from the sidelines and say, hey, I've got next. Amen. I want God to use me to be able to minister and to be able to share with this upcoming generation about the wonderful things that God has done and will do. Amen. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel like uh, that we have seen uh, some wonderful moves of God. We've seen, uh, and sure, we've seen the bad. Uh, yes, we have. I understand that. And we've seen, like we talked about this morning, a lot of things happening, and, and it's coming to the public, to the forefront, and, and we've been appalled and shocked. But really, we've seen some great moves of God. We've seen God do some amazing and awesome things. And and and. But I'm concerned that this generation that's coming up, if somebody doesn't have next, amen, if somebody doesn't rise up, I'm just concerned that they will never know what a true, real move of God is today. I'm just concerned that they may see the brass and think it's gold when it's really not the real thing at all. But some of you know what the gold is. You know what a real move of God is. You know what God is wanting to do, what He's done in times past, amen. And you and I have a responsibility to Today to shout out, I've got next, amen. I've got this next generation, amen. And as I begin to look at the word of God here today, I find that this is a concern that a man by the name of Asaph had as well. And it's been years and years ago. But the writer of this Psalms, we know that a lot of them are written by King David. Some of them are written by others. But this one here, Psalm 78, is written by, the, by a, name, a man by the name of Asaph. You can see it probably at the beginning of, of your chapter there. It will have his name it does in my Bible. And I want to talk just a little bit about Asaph. And I want to tell you kind of what's going on here. I, 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 again, I'll try not to keep you a long time tonight. I know a lot of you work tomorrow and those kinds of things. And I want you to come back, but I do want to just have the liberty. I thank you for the liberty just to share my heart with you tonight about this. Asaph was a worshiper. 
If you go back and you look in, um, uh, really in history and you, and you read about him, he was a worshiper. He was a singer. He was a musician. Bottom line, he was a worshiper. And his job was to train others how to worship the Lord. Matter of fact, if you look at, it, at him, you will find that he had even uh, established a school of worship. Some scholars will say he's established a school of worship because he realized that it was more than just saying, uh, we're going to attend church. There's got to be more today than just saying, I'm just going to go to the house of the Lord. He knew that there had to be people who knew how to worship the Lord. Now, I say today with all sincerity, of course, you know I don't have children of my own, but I do have nieces and nephews, and uh, I do have a lot of uh, spiritual uh, children, I believe, spiritual children that I could call them, uh, young people that I, I love that the Lord's enabled me and give me the the, the great privilege of speaking into their lives. And, uh, but what I've realized today is that if we're not careful, we're going to raise young people that just come in church and leave out of church. We're raising up a generation that says, I get a gold star, I attended, and that's enough. When really, in all honesty, that's not enough at all. Asaph said, we've got to train up our young people to know how to worship the Lord. Amen. I can tell you today, get them here. I encourage you, get them here. Get them in children's church. Get Get them in vacation Bible school. Get them here to be a part. But don't stop there, amen. Because, see, you were at one point somebody, there was an Asaph in your life that trained you how to worship. There was an Asaph that was in your life that trained you not just to come to church, but to give God the glory and give God the praise. Now, I don't know how you were raised, but but I'll just tell you how it happened for me. Uh, it, it doesn't come natural for us to worship the Lord. See, because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we are born with a sinful nature. Uh, we are not born to say thank you. That's why we train our children to say thank you. Say yes ma'am. Say no ma'am. We train our children because that's not the normal thing to do. It's just not the natural thing. It's also not the natural thing in a sinful nature to begin to praise the Lord and to bless the Lord, to glorify God. But I can tell you where I was raised. I'm going to talk a little bit of a, uh, some of the testimonies that I know, if you don't mind if I do that tonight. But where I was born, uh, you know, it was just one of those old-timey churches. And, and that's been a number of years ago, so um, I won't tell how long ago, but, but a number of years ago. And, and it was kind of one of those things, you, some of you may remember this, where they used to call everybody to the choir. Come on, let's all come to the choir, if you remember that. And, and we had a choir, a big choir. A, a lot of people, you know, just about when we'd get up in the choir, there'd be nobody in the seats hardly left. And, and that's just how we were raised. Everybody got up and sung to the top of their lungs and some people may not have known how to sing that good but you know they sung with all their heart and, and you know when it all come together it was amazing you know just beautiful what the Lord did and you know I remember though I'd go to that choir and, and uh, they'd, tell, they'd tell us kids they'd say now you're going to have to come on to the choir and uh, none of us knew how to sing we weren't professional but but we'd, uh, we'd get up and go to the choir you know and we'd stand up there and, and they'd help us clap I remember when I was just a tiny little girl my mom would get my hands and she'd help me to clap and, and sometimes I'd watch her she'd raise her hand well you know what happened eventually I started raising my hand you know other little kids are in there we didn't know exactly why we were raising our hand we just caught ourselves doing it with the rest of them they'd go to an altar and pray well guess what before long I'd go to the altar I didn't know if mama cried I cried I didn't know why she was crying I just cried because I, I knew God was moving I could feel the moving of the Lord and I found myself just worshiping the Lord because there were Asaphs in my life that taught me to do those things. Amen. It was more than just going to revival. It was more than just going to church. But something began to be instilled in our my heart. And I can tell you today that is what God is calling you and I to do. You say that sounds old fashioned. Not at all. Really what it is. God is calling you to be an Asaph. Get your family in church but don't stop there. Teach them how to worship the Lord. Teach them because there was an Asaph for you, God's calling you to be an Asaph for this generation. Amen. We can't just raise children. We must raise worshipers. Amen. See, what I find today is there's some of you, and I don't know, I'm looking around, maybe none of you are old enough, but I, 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 I have people in my life that went through the Great Depression, went through terrible times, but they saw God bring them out. They saw 
difficult days and, and dark, bleak times ahead of him and in the middle of it. I remember talking to my grandmother about it. And I'd ask her, I said, Mama, I said, how did the depression affect y'all? Uh, there we were. I don't know how it was here, but in the south, I said, how did, how did the depression affect y'all? She said, well, I'll tell you the truth. My mom and dad, they just serve the Lord. They live for God. And really, we did not even realize how bad it was. We had a garden. We didn't have a whole lot, but we just that's just the way we lived. And the Lord helped us. And the Lord blessed us. And, and she said, he saw us through those times in such a way that we could say, well, we didn't have an overabundance, but the Lord always supplied. And I began to think about that and how that generation has seen some terrible dark days, but they could stand and testify. But the Lord has brought me through. Amen. But the Lord delivered me out. Hallelujah. And in a time that we can look around and say in all sincerity, I don't know what's going to happen with, with insurance and I don't know what's going to happen with our retirement plans and I don't know about all that with Social Security. I mean, really, I don't know what it's going to, I don't care if it's Republicans or Democrats in the House now, in the White House now. I, I'm just not sure what's going to happen. And so what I've been doing, though, is looking back at some great men and women of God that's been through some hard times, some Asaphs to me, that's been through some hard times and they can look at me and tell me, uh, we didn't have Blue Cross Blue Shield, but the Lord delivered us. Amen. We didn't have the best health care in the world, but that's okay. The Lord healed our bodies. I can tell you today, amen, that there's Asaphs in my life, that there's times that I would get disheartened and, and, and discouraged and they would say, don't be discouraged. I've seen the Lord heal broken hearts right before our eyes. I've seen the Lord deliver people and set people free without the help of a mental doctor or without the help of a, of a, of a, of a doctor, a physical doctor. I, I can tell you today, God has always made a way and he's not about to change. He's not changed his mind. He's not a different God. The book of Hebrews says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And you and I must be Asaphs and we must tell this generation, amen, amen, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Woo. Praise the Lord. See, because when I look at the end of this, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it keeps coming to my heart, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you. When I get to the end of these scriptures that I read here, it says in verse 7, that, that talking about the children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. That they may have hope in God. I've heard it said a lot of times, and I'll be honest with you, I've said the same thing. I said, oh my goodness to the children that are born now, that are living in these last days. And what are they going to have to face? You know, I'm, I'm concerned about it. What are they going to have to face? What are they going to have to deal with? What's it going to be like for them? Will they know? But really today, the word of the Lord teaches me that yes, they can know if you and I will determine in our hearts that we won't go to the grave with this in our hearts, but we will go to the grave emptying ourselves out to this generation and letting them know that our God reigns. Amen. That our God is alive. That our God is moving. That our God is miraculous. Amen. And he's still working on the earth today so that this generation should know but not just this generation but the word says that even the unborn generation Asaph said this is not just good for our, for our kids today and it's not just good for our teenagers today but this is even for the unborn generation so that your children today will have it so in their hearts that they will also be Asaph's to children that's going to come in the world even after you're long gone amen your legacy the legacy that God has given us We'll continue to live if we will share the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have a responsibility today. Now, I know us a time in revival. We want to talk about, um, we want to talk about what God wants to do for us. And, and I thank the Lord for that. And I believe in that. But I do believe that God has given us a responsibility to take what you've already gotten from God and you begin to deliver it and tell it to a generation of young people that's searching, that's hurting, that's looking, that's, that, that's I mean, that's desperate, really. We have, a, we have a responsibility today to share with those young people. Amen. So the Asaph that taught you, there's sometimes I just have to sit down and just begin to thank the Lord 
for the Asaphs that when I was a mess and you know when I was just a I was a pretty good little girl, I guess, but but when I, I, I could have went in the wrong direction, I had Asaphs that would pull me in. Amen. I'll tell you something right quick. It comes to my mind. We had an Asaph. Her name is, uh, oh, oh, my goodness, her name just slipped my mind. I can see her right before me. Good woman, just a good woman. And I won't ever forget, though, <laughs> we would, um, in the church that I, I was a part of for a number of years, about 11 years as the associate pastor, when I got there, we had a lot of young ladies coming in, a lot of young girls, and we lived in a college town, and, and uh, I went, her name is Sister Allen, Sister Cora Allen. Sister Allen would come up, and if their dresses were too short, she'd just come right up and put a little a little blanket over their legs, and I thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe that she's willing to, and they would let her, you know. Uh, nobody thought mean about her or mad at her, you know, because they she'd say, honey, you're going to need to cover your legs, and don't, t- don't bring that drink back in the church, you know, and I think, oh my goodness, for men and women today that would rise up with the love of God in our hearts that we could teach a generation, amen, how to be respectful, how to worship, amen, how to love the Lord, how to be what God has called us to be, praise the Lord. And these benefits are available to us still today, but somebody's got to tell it. So so really what I want you to see today is the worship that you give the Lord is good, it's good and it's wonderful, but it's not just for your benefit. As we saw this morning with Mary Magdalene, what a benefit in worshiping the Lord but let's go beyond that there's an also a great benefit for your family when you worship the Lord amen there's also a great benefit for your children and for your grandchildren when you worship the Lord because sometimes you don't even have to open your mouth and you can be an ASAP as they watch you amen as you teach them by example hallelujah that's what God is calling you to do today amen My daddy never told me one time that I needed to get on my knees and pray and call on God. But you know how I knew? I knew it not because I sit in church all of my life and heard the preachers preach most of the time. Those those preachers, the words would go in one ear and out the other. But I'll tell you what made the difference is what happened at my house. And I knew that my daddy got up every morning and prayed. I heard him. And we prayed every single night before we went to bed. He called us all in. And we'd have to pray in their bedroom. He and mom's bedroom. We'd have to pray around the bed. And there's a lot of times I wouldn't pray. And my brothers wouldn't pray. And we'd be pinching each other and poking each other. But I can tell you, it got ingrained in my heart. Amen. It got ingrained in their hearts. And now my brother's calling me. And he says, we're doing a devotion with the kids. And this is what blah, blah, blah. And I said, thank you. Lord, amen, that very thing that my daddy and my mama started in my home, amen, in their home, in my home, the very thing that mama and daddy started is still going from generation to generation, now my nieces and nephews, seven years old, ten years old, they say, come on, let's do devotion tonight, amen, and that same thing, amen, that ASAP is speaking unto them, they will be an ASAP to another generation, amen, amen, Woo. I feel a stirring in my heart about this. I feel passionate about it. If we drop the ball, if we drop the ball, what could happen in this next generation? If you and I plan on pastor taking care of it all, we are sadly mistaken. If you are planning on evangelists, teachers, pastors, uh, apostles, and prophets to take care of all of it, the five-fold ministry, no. It's got to be mamas. It's got to be daddies. It's got to be school teachers. It's got to be counselors. It's got to be mechanics. It's got to be nurses. I don't care who you are today. God says you have a responsibility. You may be a mechanic, but you're an ASAP. Amen. You may be a nurse but you're an ASAP. You may be a school teacher, but you're an ASAP. Amen. We are to train this next generation. Hallelujah today. Woo. Let me just keep going. I'm probably so far ahead of myself, but I'm going to go to what I have on my notes is point number two. And let's just look at it real quick in verse three is where I want you to look. I probably already talked all about it, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it here. It says, which we have heard and which we have known. I want you to notice that there. 
It talks about in a different version of the Bible. In verse 2 it talks about, I will utter dark sayings of old. Really what that's talking about, I will uh, tell of the things that the Lord has done. I will tell of the past is what that's talking about. It says which we have, oh, things that God has done. It says now that we have heard and that we have known and our fathers have told us. Verse 4 says, and we will not hide them from our, their children, our children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. But the first thing that I want you to see, let's look back at verse 3 for just a moment. It says, which we have heard. I want to talk for a moment about what we have heard. Like I said, I've already kind of hit at it a little bit, but I want you to understand this a little clearer. If you look through the rest of verse of chapter 78, you will find that Asaph's father and his grandfather had told him, read it for yourself. It's so many of the things that God had done in his father's life and in his grandfather's life. It talks about leading the children out of the Egyptian bondage. It talks about what happened in the wilderness. All throughout the rest of this chapter, it tells of the amazing things that God had done and the things that Asaph had heard from his father. It tells, starting in, in I think right around verse 12, it talks about all the miracles of the past. And when I began to study this, I think this is so amazing. I can't really pronounce it too well, but I'll try my best. Uh, Asaph's father's name was Berechiah. Berechiah, if I'm not mistaken, is the way it, that it's pronounced. And his name means blessed by God. And so when Asaph begins to hear from his father, he's hearing from one who was blessed by God, who knew the blessings of the Lord, who walked in the blessings of the Lord. I think that's so amazing. And so when his father would speak to him, he would speak to him the blessings. The same thing, his grandfather would speak to him the blessings. And he is quoting here and speaking here of the things that that he had heard about. So I began to think about in my life, of the Asaphs in my life, of what I have heard. I told you about my grandmother there with, um, uh, uh, with the Great Depression, but I'd like to take you a little bit deeper for just a few moments. I remember talking to my, my grandfather, my Papa Stevens, my daddy's daddy. He was a tall, skinny man, very tall, lanky man, but I'm talking about a preacher of the gospel. And in our area, really, uh, people would tell you that he knew the Bible and could quote the Bible probably uh, better than most anybody that ever heard. I would get off the school bus and have to go to their home when it was uh, when school was over. And when I would get there, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but he had those big albums, those big records, and it would be Alexander Scorby. Does anybody know who that is, Alexander Scorby, or is that out of your... Okay, well, some of you know he was one that he would read. He, he um, read the Bible and put it on on albums, on records. And, and so Papa would be in there. And my goodness, honestly, he sounded like a lawnmower, this man, his voice. And, and you'd listen to him, and I'd fall asleep, sure enough, every day after school. But Papa would listen to him, one record after the next, after the next, listening to the Bible, being read to him there. And, and he was just an amazing man of God, an amazing pastor. Uh, he, he would look kind of humped over a little bit and he'd walk real slow from the front row to the pulpit but he'd be about I guess he'd be about 10 minutes into it and before you knew it I can't show you because I have on a dress he'd kick his leg up higher than his head he'd be so excited preaching about who God was and what God was and what he wanted to do I mean I can remember so many times seeing Papa dancing down the aisle but it didn't start that way and that's the thing that I want to share with you for a moment. I will ever forget. I'd say, Papa, how'd you get saved? How did this happen to you? And he says, well, Beth, and he's a quiet man He until he got to preaching. He says, well, Beth, he says, I, I was a, a running from God. And I don't remember if he, if he was working or if he was in the service. I can't remember. But he was from, we were from Georgia. And he says, but, but it, the work took him to Miami, Florida. He said, I was miserable away from from my family and, and I got sick sick as I could be down there and I got on the my face in the bathroom floor some of you know what that feels like he said I got my, on my face in the bathroom floor sick as I could be and I said oh God if you will get me back home I'll live for you and I'll serve you sure enough the Lord got him home but he did not follow through with his promise to the Lord he got home and he kept living like the devil really he kept living wild and crazy but there was a single woman that came 
uh, to his church there, to that church in that community for revival. She was an evangelist. And there she was preaching uh, this revival. But what he didn't know was that she knew about him. And every day she would go out in a ditch beside the church and she would pray all day long for the Lord to save Johnny Stevens. She prayed for him. She began to call him in. And he says, I don't know what happened for sure. He said, I didn't know that woman was praying for me. But he says, all I knew was this. One day I found myself in that revival. And I found myself on the back road. But before it was over with, I found myself at an altar. And I gave my heart to the Lord. Amen. He said, the Lord saved me. The Lord saved me and set me free. And then he says this. He says, and he called me to preach. I said, just like that, Papa? He said, oh, yeah. He called me to preach just like that. I said, you had never been saved before? You never had any training? He said, no training at all. I said, who did you preach to? He said, anybody that listened. I'd stop in every nursing home. I'd stop in every every uh, parking space. I'd stand beside every stop sign. And I'd preach the gospel. And people would get saved on the sidewalk. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, I'm telling you, Beth, God moved. God delivered me. God set me free. And when he died at almost 90 years old, he had served the Lord. I don't know how many years that he had been a Christian, but he had pastored for years and years and years. And you say, what is that to you? It's an Asaph. It's an Asaph to me that the Lord will bring you through hard days, difficult days, and he'll deliver. He'll set free. Amen. But then I have to tell you about my other grandfather just quickly. I'll tell you about my other grandfather. He was a gambler. He was a womanizer. He was a drinker. He was everything that you would think somebody could not be and be called of God. This man, he did, he did everything. His name was, his last name was Hearn. First name was Herman. Herman Hearn. How you like that? Herman Hearn. And he was a big man. And he was like one of the stories that you'd hear people talk about. My mom, he, my mom, it was my mom and her two brothers and my grandmother. And she'd work hard and Papa would work. But he wouldn't come home on Fridays. He'd go spend the entire check and show up before he had to go to work on Monday. He'd gamble it away. He would club it away. I'm telling you, he, he, it was horrible what was happening in that family. But Mama got to praying. Amen. Mama began to call on the Lord. And I don't know all the details of how it happened. But one day, Papa said, I found myself in a mess in my life. And I said, I just got to get to God. He said, I found myself coming in the church door one day, one Sunday. And I found my, in a, no, I'm sorry, in a revival. He said, it was in a revival. And I found myself clawing my way to the front, getting to an altar. I had to get prayer. And he said, and the Lord said, saved me. And I said, what happened, Papa? He said, and he called me to preach. I said, just like that. He said, just like that. I said, where did you preach? He said, I preached in the meals. I preached to my friends. Every time they'd give me a chance in a church, I'd preach in a church. It didn't matter to me. I had to tell people what the Lord had done for me. Amen. Hallelujah today. You say, tell me about an ace house. It might not be your mother or your grandfather or your grandmother or your daddy. It may not be. It could be a woman in the church. It could be a man in your neighborhood that's taught you about the Lord. Nevertheless, God will give you an Asaph. God has given you an Asaph, but now he's calling you to be an Asaph to tell somebody about the great things of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, this is the thing. My grandmother, I'll just tell them both to you in a hurry. And I don't usually do this a lot when I preach, but I think it's necessary in this. Both of my grandmothers have experienced phenomenal healings in their bodies, just phenomenal. My grandmother has been sick so many times, different things, gorders have fell off of her neck. She said she didn't have insurance. They were in the ministry. She didn't have any insurance, and she kept praying. One day, one morning, she got up to cook breakfast. She said, I was in the kitchen. And the power of God began to move in that kitchen. And she said, I went to the bathroom where the light was good. And I said, God, what in the world's going on? She said, I looked and the gorder was completely dissolving off of her neck. She said, I saw it. It was completely dissolving off of my neck. Then there was a time not too awfully long. Um, really, she was probably in her 80s. And, and the doctor called and, and said, Miss Hearn, you've got a bad report. You've got cancer. Uh, we found a spot of cancer on your lung. And I remember, I'm telling you, we were all crying. And, oh, God, what, 
are we going to do? How are we going? You know, Mama's the matriarch. You know, she's the strong one in the family. We got to pray it and believe in God. And one day, uh, Mama called me and, and she was praising the Lord. I said, What's going on? She says, Well, I'm telling you, the Lord's healed me. I said, How do you know? Have you been to the doctor? She said, No, but I know what it feels like to be healed and I'm healed. And I said, What happened to you? She said, I knelt in front of my couch last night. She said, The Lord began to bless me. The presence of the Lord came into the living room. She said, nobody was there but me and God. And she said, I'm standing here a hill woman. Oh, my goodness. I said, go to the doctor. See what he says. <laughs> she said, I, and she went to the doctor about a week or two later. She called him. She said, I want you to check this again. I believe it's gone. Sure enough, she got the report back. He said, well, Miss Hurd, we must have misread your thing because we don't see a thing on your lung anymore. Amen. You say, oh, was it a mistake? No, it was a miracle. And that's an ASAP in my life to let me know I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what people say. I know a miracle working God. Amen. And the same God that moved in years past is the same God that's moving for me today. That will move for you tomorrow and your children and your grandchildren. I could keep on and on about that, you know. I've got so many stories that just excites me. I just get thrilled over telling the people about them. But you know, the Bible says, in verse 3, it says, which we have heard, I've heard about them. They told me, and I'm so glad that I've heard about them. But then it says, we have heard and known. <laughs> it's one thing for you to tell, for me to tell you about what Mama and Papa said. <laughs> it's one thing for me to tell you what happened to my Mama and my Daddy. It's another thing for me to tell you about what happened in years past that I've read about in books with Smith Wigglesworth and all these great men and women of God, Catherine Kuhlman. But it's a whole different thing for me to stand up here and say, I didn't just hear it. I also know because I've seen it with my own eyes. This great God I'm telling you about, this Asaph that's speaking to you, I'm not just telling you what somebody else has told me. I've seen it myself. I've seen God move in my life. I've experienced the healings in my life. I've experienced a breakthrough in my life. I've experienced financial miracles in my life that looked like absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing was going to be able to turn around. And God supernaturally moved and fixed a situation. Amen. Woo. I just had to tell you about him right quick. I was going to try to make it quick. But I, I'm just going to tell you real quick. I won't ever forget. I was um, I was in my early 20s. I'd never lived away from home at this point. And, I, I, of course, you know I was single, still single. And um, and so I, I moved to Alabama. A very long story, but I'm going to shorten it. Um, I lived in Georgia, and all my family, everybody I knew lived in Georgia. Just about, and uh, and so this pastor called me and wanted me to come to be the youth pastor. Well, I didn't want to; I had no desire to. And uh, but the Lord began to work it out. I knew it was the will of the Lord. I just knew that I didn't want to move from my home. I, I didn't want to leave the comfort. You know, you understand uh, the comfort of family and support and all that. And I said, "Oh Lord," I said, "I, I don't want to move to Alabama. It's a couple hours from my family, and I don't know anybody there. I don't know anybody in the church. I just graduated from X-ray school and." And I, I was going to have to get a job there. And I thought, when will I ever get to go home? I, I'm going to be a part-time youth pastor. And I'll be having to work every single weekend doing that. And, and working uh, during the week in my, in, in my job as an x-ray tech. And I said, God, I don't want to do that. I'll never see my family. And I mean, I was, I'm, we're a very close family. And I was stressed out about it. And I said, besides all that, how will I ever pay my bills? I mean, the church was hardly going to pay me anything. And, and, uh, and I wasn't going to make I was a brand new x-ray tech. And so I, I was are going to make a lot of money doing that and, and I said God I need a new car I, need, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it the Lord kept working it out I mean every turn I made he was working it out I knew it was the Lord's will but I won't ever forget I got over there and a good friend of mine she's a good bit old, a little bit older than me and she said uh, I'm going to help you budget because she knew how stressed out I was about it she says she's, a, she's great with numbers and she said I'm going to help you we're going to work out a budget and you need you have to stick by this budget and I said okay I was just dumb enough to, okay, whatever. I was nervous, you know, about it. And so she started going through my checkbook and my bills. I didn't have really many bills or anything at that time. But she started going through and she was writing this budget. And I'm going to be blunt with you because I feel like that we're friends enough that I can be blunt. But uh, she was writing it down and she got all the way down to the end. And she kept shaking her head. I said, what's wrong? She said, I just don't think it's going to work. 
I said, well, it's got to work. I, I mean, I've, I've already, at that point, I'd already moved. I said, it's got to work. She says, well, I figured your whole budget out. She said, as long as you don't have to buy soap and toilet paper, you're okay. She said, but if you have to do that, she said, you're in trouble. She said, there's not enough money. And I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the words that came out of her mouth. And I said, oh, my goodness. I said, well, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I said, I'm just going to have to believe God. I know he brought me here, and we're just going to believe the Lord. And I, I was driving an old car, and I was having to drive a lot for work, and I knew I needed a new car. And then I was over there all by myself. I didn't have nobody to fall back on, nobody to lean on. Nobody I could call. My mom and daddy weren't wealthy, and, and I, I couldn't call them and say, hey, I need some money. I, I just knew that the Lord's going to have to make a way in this. And I'll tell you something that the Lord taught me. He taught me about tithing and about giving. Now, I already knew this from years ago. My daddy taught me. My Asaph taught me what it meant to be a tither and a giver. Uh, he taught me when I was 15 years old, when I was a babysitter, and I had to give a dollar fifty at church one morning because I'd made $15. I thought, Daddy, that's ridiculous. But it taught me, it taught me a principle. Amen. Uh, I, I mean, if you're not a tither or a giver, I challenge you today to talk to me about it because I will encourage you with the Word of God. You will find that it will absolutely open up the windows of heaven in your life. It will. I promise you I've seen it happen and this is what I knew because my daddy taught me, when I, my Asaph taught me when I was 15 years old, maybe younger than that, to be a tither. When I got over there to Alabama and my money wouldn't work, I did this. I said, this is what I know. And, and Rob, my friend, put it on top. She put, this is going to be your tithe. This is how much you're making. This is your tithe. And I knew I had to pay it first. I had to give it first. The first thing I did. She said, whatever you do, don't miss out. And I said, I'm not going to miss out. I would give that tithe every Sunday in church. Every Sunday I'd give it. And then I'd pay the rest of my bills. Now, I don't know how it happened. I'm just being honest with you. I don't have any idea how it happened. But I can tell you this. I always had more than enough. There was always money in the bank. And when it finally come time that I bought a car, probably a year into my time there, I was able to buy a brand new vehicle, Toyota Camry. Thank you, Lord. I was able to buy a brand new vehicle. People looked around and they said, how in the world do you afford that? I said, well, I can tell you what. It's not me. It's the Lord. Amen. The Lord made a way. Not one time did I ever go back. It. Not one time did I ever do it out. My mom and daddy, thank God, I guess they would have if they had to. They never had to send me a dime. You say, how did it happen? I want to tell you. Because I heard about him and I tried it for myself. Amen. And I got to experience by myself the true move of God. Amen. It's kind of like Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah went over that river and he threw his, put his coat out and the river parted. But when Elijah was taken away, Elisha took that coat up and he went back to the river himself. And he put that coat on that river and the water parted for Elisha. I want to tell you today, thank God for what he did for Elijah, but I'm the generation of Elisha, and God's doing it for us. God's moving for us. God is miraculous for us, and we got to tell the world. We've got to be an Asaph. I've heard about what he's done, but I've also seen it. I've already testified to you about it, but just two more minutes. When I was uh, in 2011, June the 1st, 2011, somebody was asking me about it earlier today, and they said, didn't you have to have heart surgery? I did. But I want to tell you today, the same healer that healed my grandmothers and my grandfather, my mom, my dad, is the same healer that reached out to me that had heart open heart surgery on the on a Wednesday on June the 1st. And I went home on Friday, June the 3rd. Amen. The nurses and doctors were clapping as we walked out of the door. Amen. Amazed. And they said, wow, you did great. Who was your doctor? I said, well, this was my natural doctor. But I, I have to give glory to God for what's happened in my life. Amen. I've got to tell you today, he's not just somebody I've heard about. I've seen it in my life. He's a healer. Amen. He's been my deliverer. He's been my help. He's been my strength in the middle of temptation. He's been my strong tower. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise the Lord, I'll tell you. Today I feel like I could preach all day telling you what is going on. We have a responsibility. You and I, you and I today are Asaphs. Amen. And God has called us because generations past have taught us how to worship, have taught us of the things of God. Now you and I have got to pick up the torch 
We got to pick up the mantle. We got to we got to we got to pick it up today and say, "Let me tell you about our great God." Amen. Let me keep going for just a few moments, and I'm going to close. If you'll give me a few more minutes, I begin to look at this. Though it says, "Which we have heard and known, our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children." Showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. And He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their ch- children. you got to see this in verse 6. So that that generation to come might know them. They may know the works of God. Even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children. That they might set their hope in God. And for not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Can I tell you today, this generation is looking for something that's real, that's true, that's powerful, that's not watered down. You know they're looking for something. If you don't believe it today, if you don't believe that today, you talk to any young person. I had the great opportunity, I was sharing, telling, sharing with, with Sister Kitty, I, I've got a dear friend of mine that's got a teenager that's about, she's 16 or 17 years old. And this is what she told me. She said, Beth, it's like this. She says, we want the real thing. We're tired of preachers full of hype. We're tired of preachers getting up with a lot of fluff. She says, and trying to just to rally everybody, come on, somebody, come on. And you know, that's all right, but I'm just telling you, it's got to be more than a, with somebody pumping you up. Amen. It's got to be more than somebody just trying to make you do this. Or, no, there's got to be some real and some st- substance in it. And I think for years we've been looking at and dealing with, with people that know how to work a crowd and to manipulate a crowd. But I can tell you today, the scriptures come to me just recently again. We've not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom but with the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And that's what that young girl told me. She said, we want something real. We want something that works. We want what the Bible says is available to us today. We want the healings. She said, we want the miracles. We want to see it right before our eyes. Amen. If God is real like you say he is, that's what she said, with respect. But she said, if God is real like you say he is, we want to see the Bible miracles happening in today. Today's time. And do you know today, amen, that if you and I will keep believing the truth, if we'll keep holding fast to the truth, if we'll keep praying and having faith for the word of God to be manifested, God is still working in this hour, in this day that we live in. Amen. This generation's wanting to see it. They don't want to see a lot of fluff, a lot of hype. They're looking for the real thing. And this is really the sincerity of it. I go to a lot of churches. And I go to a lot of... Big churches, little churches in between. And, I, and thankfully, I thank the Lord for the opportunities, all different backgrounds and all different denominations. And, and, he, and he's opening up the borders. We're going out further and going to new churches. And I've seen them with the lights and the smoke. And I've seen them very traditional. I've seen them when they cut all the lights off and it's dark when you go. I've been there before. I've been there where, where they have worship that's a, a totally uh, different, maybe sometimes it's it's more of a, uh, I, I don't know how to how you would say it here, but we call it more of like a, the black gospel. We have uh, in our church that I'm from, we we've got about at least uh, half of us are uh, African Americans there and Hispanics. I mean, we've got and, and so I've seen all kinds of worship, so that doesn't bother me. I don't care. I don't care how you sing it. I don't care if you come out with a banjo and and a and a, and a fiddle. That doesn't bother me. That's not important to me. Now, this is if you ever get my iPod or my iPhone, you can listen to it. And I listen to every kind of music there is in Christian music. I listen to Chris Tomlin and I listen to Kirk Franklin. And I, I love it. I, I listen to I, I listen to Amazing Grace and I listen to the newest thing out there. And the reason I do is because I go to so many different churches and they do it so differently. And I want to be able to understand some of the new stuff, some of the old stuff, and be able to blend it in. You understand what I'm saying? But this is what makes the difference. It's not if the lights are there or if the lights are on or off. It's not if the music, if they got a drummer or they don't have a drummer. It's not if they have a Hammond B3 or they don't have a Hammond B3. I love all that now. Woo! I do. That's right up my alley. But that doesn't have a thing to do with it. 
What it has to do with today is once, once they are outside of this building, if they have not experienced a true move of God, I don't care how many instruments you have or the lights are on or off, it won't make a dab of difference. This generation is wanting something that they can hold on to, that they can sink their teeth into, that they can say this is the real and true and supernatural God. Amen. Amen today. So I don't care how you present it, how you bring it in. You cannot water down the gospel. This generation is looking for the true move. Amen. The power of God. Hallelujah. There's a lot of people today. There's a movement that is going on across this nation. And I believe really it's this nation. There's a movement that's going across this nation to water down the gospel. They're, and I'll be honest with you. They're trying to dumb it down for this generation. But if I've ever seen a generation that does not need it dumbed down, it is this generation. I'm looking at kids today that can play with the iPhone when they're two years old and they can do more with the iPhone than I can. So I don't think that generation needs it dumbed down. They need the truth. You don't have to try to manipulate the Word of God. The Word of God can stand on its own. So today, amen, it is not another book. It is the inspired Word of God. And it will stand when this earth is shaking. Amen. I challenge you, Asaph, to give them the Word, to give them the truth, to give them the power of God, to speak the Word of God. Amen. That is what this generation is looking for today, if you'll help me. My goodness, it is uh, it is burning in my spirit and in my heart today for this generation. What are we going to do if you don't tell them? What are they going to do if they don't know a God that can carry, if they, a God that can carry the United States through a Great Depression? They need to know, because I don't know what our days ahead are looking at, looking like, do you? I mean, I don't. It's frightening, really. They need to know that our God is a God that will bring you through. He'll bring you up. He'll bring you over. And He won't just barely bring you out by the skin of your teeth. He'll bring you through with the victory. Amen. Who's going to tell your children? if you? Don't? I can't depend on pastor to do it all. I can't depend on, we can't depend on our school systems to do it. Not at all. We can't depend on a youth pastor or children's pastor to do it. Not at all. People will say, well, somewhat, but my goodness, what are they here two or three times a week? They need mamas and daddies to begin to share the word. People will say all the time, and you know this already. I'm just going to share something that you already know. People say, well, I, I'm, I, am, this is, I have to be careful not to get on a soapbox right here. People say, well, this generation just doesn't need all that screaming and hollering. Well, go to a football game and tell them, would you? Because so, somebody, somebody don't believe that. Go, go to a concert. Go, go to a concert. We passed that casino on the way here. And who's going to be there? Somebody's going to be there. I can't remember what name it was. Somebody's name. Some big name. Try, tell all those people that screaming and hollering that they really didn't want that. They just, I don't know how. I don't know why they're doing that. See, I, I'm so tired of that. And they'll say, oh, they don't need all that excitement. They want to come in and it be reverent in the house of the Lord. I'll tell you, there's no better way to reverence the Lord than to worship His name, than to be a worshiper, as Asaph said, to teach them to worship. Not one time did I ever say, well, see where God says, don't worship me loud. Don't worship me by clapping. Don't worship me by raising your hands. Just the opposite. It says lift up your hands in the sanctuary. It says clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. It says in Ezra that the people heard him from afar off because they were shouting so loud. Amen. I live in Athens, Georgia. And when the Georgia Bulldogs are playing, you can hear them screaming and shouting downtown. Not, they ain't even at the ball game and they're already screaming and hollering. Oh yeah, you'll never convince me that this generation is not a passionate generation. Oh yes, it is. Oh yes, it is. The world will say tame it down. You know why? Because the devil wants to say tame it down. You know why? Because he wants these young people to believe we serve a powerless God. We serve a powerless God. And he's just going to help them barely make it through. Maybe maybe touch their lives. Maybe, no, I, I, I want to tell you this God is powerful. He is all-knowing. He's here for you today. Amen. What about him? Asaph, who's got next today? Who's got next? Amen. Who's got next? I believe that's a question. Who's got next? 
Who's got this next generation? Who's got next today? Who's got next? If you've got next today, would you just lift your hands up and say, I've got next. I've got next. I'll testify. I'll tell it. I'll tell the truth. I'll tell of his power. I've got next today. That's what God is looking for in our lives. Amen. Would you stand up on your feet today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I preached a little probably about what I thought I'd preach. It gets all on the inside of me. It's hard to cut it short. But oh, my goodness. When we start talking about the things that Asaph talked about, about the miracles, it's just hard to cut it short, isn't it? It's hard to say, well, no, I want to tell you. If I could get to every one of you, I'd say, oh, I want to tell you how great God is, what he wants to do in your life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes today? This, this altar call is going to be for you initially, and then we're going to change it just a little bit. But, but let me first give this altar call. You say, Beth, if I were to die today, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. If I were to die today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven or if I'd go to hell. I really don't know what my future would be like. But see, that's not God's fault because God sent His Son to die on a cross for you. And if you would believe on Him, the Bible says you don't have to perish, but you can have everlasting life. You don't have to die and go to an eternal place of torment called hell. But you, when you leave out of this world, you can continue living. Matter of fact, you can live better than you've ever lived before. And that's in a place called heaven. But you must make Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to ask you today, are you here today? You say, Beth, I'm away from God. If I were to die today, I'd know I'd go to an eternal torment. I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. If that's you, would you slip your hand up right now? Anybody here that you would raise your hand and you'd say, pray for me. Thank you. Anybody else right now? You may say, well, Beth, I'm not, I'm not an unbeliever. Let me make it a little clearer. Is Jesus number one in your life? Is Jesus first in your life? If he's not, then I'm, I'm talking to you. See, because if Jesus is not Lord over all, then he's not Lord at all in your life. And you say, oh, I know him. I'm not talking about just knowing his name. I know President Barack Obama. But I don't really have a relationship with him. A lot of people know God about like that. You know Jesus about like that. You know his name. You, you know he come up out of the tomb on the third day. You know he died on a cross. But you don't have a relationship with him. So today I'm talking to you. You say, Beth, I, don't, I know his name, but I don't really know him. Is there anybody here right now? Anybody else? There was one hand that was raised. Anybody else? Before we go any further and you say, Beth, it's me. Pray for me. Pray for me. I don't see any hands raised, any other hands raised. So I want to take a moment. And I want to give you an opportunity today. If you say, Beth, I want to be an Asaph. You've all raised your hands in here. But let me take it a step further. You say, I want to be an Asaph. But I need the strength of God today. I need the strength of heaven. I don't know exactly maybe how to do it. I don't know what to say. I, I need the wisdom of God in my life to be the Asaph that God's called me to be. If that's you today, would you slip your hand up? Amen. Right here in this place, would you just slip your hand up? Amen. I'm going to ask you from the front to the back, if you raise your hand to be born again, to rededicate your life, or if you raise your hand that God's called you to be that Asaph to this generation, you say, Beth, I need help from heaven. I'm going to ask you to leave out of your seat, and I'm going to ask us to come and kneel in this altar today. Would you do it? I want you to come right now from the front to the back. Pastor's going to help me pray in just a few moments, but I want to give you a few minutes just to pray, just to talk to the Lord. And then, Lord willing, we may pray for one other thing before we close today. But the first thing that I want us to do is I want us to give it to the Lord today. Father, help me. Help me to be the Asaph. Help me to be the Asaph you've called me to be. Come on. Come on. That's right. That's right. Just whenever you're ready. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah, that's right. Oh, God. Come on, God's calling you. God's needing you today. God needs an ASAP. God needs the ASAP right now. Hallelujah. He's speaking your name. He's calling you out today. All he's looking for is a man, a woman.
from him. To say, yes, oh God, use me. Use me. Use me in my home. Use me and my children. Come on, church. Would you lift your hands up? And let's just begin to pray in the sanctuary. And today, if you're a prayer warrior in this sanctuary and you're still sitting by, would you come up in this altar? I'm going to ask you just to help me. Let's lay hands on people in this altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you today. Come on. Give me the boldness of the Holy Ghost. Give me the boldness of the Holy Ghost. The boldness, oh God, to speak the word. To say the word. Lord, I need you today. I need you today. Guide me and direct me. Father, for my sister, guide her, direct her. Oh, Lord, in her home, in her family, her husband as well. Oh, Lord, minister through him. Not just to him, but through him. A wealth of knowledge here. A wealth of knowledge here. Oh, God, may we not leave this world with it on the inside. But let us be rivers of water. Not the Dead Sea, but rivers of water pouring out what you put in us. Pouring out what you put in us in Jesus' name. Lord, we've got next. We've got next. We've got next. We've got this next generation. Oh, Lord, minister to them today. Minister to them today. Oh, Lord, I won't expect somebody else to get the job done. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Father, for these men and women in this altar, may they experience such a fresh move of your glory, such a fresh outpouring of your grace, that, Lord, they'll be able to tell it. They'll be able to seek it. They'll be able to share it. In Jesus' name. More than
Come on, church, would you just lift your hands up, would you, right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You just keep singing that. If you would, let us just worship with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I bless your name, Jesus. my name. Thank you, Jesus. do something as they still are praying in the altar if you don't mind I, I'm not I know this is not comfortable to do and I'm not crazy about it when preachers ask me to do it so I'm going to try to do it sen- with sensitivity but I just believe there's some people that could have needed to come to this altar and did and there's times that I'll say well let's just go home they missed the opportunity but I just don't feel like that today I'm going to ask you to take a neighbor's hand Maybe it's somebody you know. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's somebody you don't know. But I I want you to take somebody's hand or or maybe just put your hand on their shoulder. Whatever you do, just in a respectful way. Just make a point of contact. I'm going to ask you to do that, would you? I just want you to look around. That's right. Just look around. There's some people that are here. There's some people that are here today that I know sometimes it's hard to move. I understand that. I just feel that in my spirit. I, I feel it strong enough to to want to ask you in spite of it being uncomfortable at times I just want you to grab a hold of somebody that's good that's good just grab a hold of somebody's hand let's pray I I want you to get ready right now I want us to pray amen thank you Jesus I want us to get ready to pray come on everybody got somebody amen Thank you, Lord. I'm going to do something. I'm going to take a risk of embarrassing some people. Uh, The lady in the coral shirt in the middle, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you. There's a girl in the black shirt over here. I can't get to her and still keep going up here. But a younger girl, and and she's sitting there, and she's holding another woman's hand. Yeah, I want this lady in the coral to pray for you and the other woman. If you three women, that's good. Just grab a hold to her. I know that's kind of weird, and I put people on the spot a little bit. I want us to do that, and I know the other lady had her hand, but y'all keep on. Don't You don't have to let go, but let's pray. Come on, I want us to pray. Let's believe God. Will you just pray out loud with me right now? Come on, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, come on, church, you pray. Oh, Lord, I'm asking you right now to minister to these people, minister to these young people to this older generation. Some of them feel like their time has passed. Some of them feel like what did they have to give. But oh Lord, you've got so much to flow through them. You've got so much that you've placed inside of them. Lord, I pray today that it doesn't die in that generation, but they'll pour it out to this next generation. Oh Lord, there's some that are in here that are single. There's some in here that are married. Oh Lord, there's some that's in here that may be divorced. But, Lord, that's not a concern to you. You want to use them. You want to flow through them. Oh, God, I'm asking you today that you administer to every man and every woman in this place. That you would put a burden in their heart for this generation. Put a burden in their heart for the truth. The truth, Lord. The truth that has set them free. Father, I'm asking you today, hallelujah, that you would let this generation see the glory of God. Let us see the glory of God fresh. Let us see a move of God fresh, oh Lord. Oh Lord, for this generation that's only heard about it. For this generation that's only read about it. We don't want to just have heard about it, Lord. We want to know about it. Let us see you fresh. Let us see you in your power. Let us see you in your greatness, oh God. I'm asking you, Lord, to touch every man and woman in this place. Give us the boldness of Simon Peter as he stepped out of that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Give us the boldness of Simon Peter to speak your word, to share your word today. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing in this place, in these lives. Father, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, that's right. You don't have to quit. You just keep on. That's right. Why don't you hug somebody's neck today? Thank you, Lord. That's right. Just hug somebody.
somebody's neck right now and just tell them, say, I'm an ASAP. I know I've put y'all on the spot. I couldn't get that man to you. God's got good things for you, great things for you, my He's called you to be an ASAP. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord today. Look at somebody say, I'm an ASAP. I'm an ASAP. Hallelujah. I'm God next. I'm God next. I'm God next. I'm God this next generation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. They're still in the altar today. I'm not going to rush them. No, don't you rush them if you don't mind. Would you just lift your hands up and let's just worship for a few more moments. Would you do it? As God ministers to them in this altar. If any of you ladies want to come around and pray with these young ladies in this altar. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I believe God's moving. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just lift your hands up? Let's just worship the Lord today. Hallelujah. Let's just worship Him today. Oh, next generation. Praise the Lord. Amen. What God is doing. Would you give the Lord a praise? Amen. They're still praying. Amen. I don't want to stop them. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know that song that just says, Oh, how I love Jesus.
wonderful. Do you know that part? It says to me.
respectful. He's praying, amen, if you need to go. Amen. We, we want to encourage and invite somebody out. There'll be some other churches and things in here tomorrow night. Amen. I had some other pastors say they'd probably come. Uh, you probably got some friends and things coming, maybe some that had a church today of their own. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's been good, and what a wonderful word tonight from the Lord. Amen. Praise. Who's next? Amen. Praise the Lord. And I believe it spoke to our hearts tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. With that, amen. I'm not going to just really go in God's grace tonight. God bless you. God keep you and preserve you. Amen. So we're back here for a brand new day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen.